Mark chapter 6. Perhaps you'll remember with me as we've been going through this book, specifically in this chapter, that we're in this moment in Mark chapter 6 in which Jesus is now including his 12 guys, his disciples. And up to this point in the scriptures, they've always been kind of, kind of identified that way. At least in these first five, stepping into chapter six, chapters of the gospel of Mark, they're called his disciples, which kind of just means simply someone who was learning from Jesus, someone who's apprenticing from Jesus, someone who's kind of interning and following, actively seeking to learn from Jesus. And now where we are in Mark chapter six, it's interesting. He's starting to include them in ministry in a way that he hadn't before. Remember with me verse 12 of this chapter. We'll just put it up on the screen. We're seeing some powerful things happening with them and through them. Verse 12 says, So the disciples went out, telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and to turn to God. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. We're at this moment in the Gospel of Mark where things are beginning to change a little, where Jesus is now sending out his disciples, and here's what's happening. They are doing the same kind of things that up to this point, we've only seen Jesus do. And last week, Mark kind of brought us back, kind of a flashback to the death of John the Baptist. And kind of our key takeaway was to keep focused on winning at the right things in light of eternity. We're encouraged to keep in tension this reality of walking with Jesus. There's this reality of cost and also this reality of blessing. It's like Mark kind of holds in comparison or in juxtaposition this reality of like the disciples are going out in authority and power and effective, fruitful, amazing ministry. They're they're winning, so to speak, and John, John's losing. And these are truths that we keep in constant balance in our own lives. And now, as we step into Mark 6 this morning, it seems to be kind of like a pivot in the chapter. You say, what do you mean? We've seen throughout Mark's gospel much about who Jesus is evidence that validates who he is. We've seen Jesus's insights and his teachings and these wonderful parables that he shares about the kingdom of God. But Mark, over and over and again throughout the book, he's showing that Jesus is not just kind of a pontificator of parables, not not just some spiritual voice in the maze of a culture where there's many different voices, kind of like our culture today. No matter what platform you get on, someone's kind of spouting something. Jesus isn't like that. Jesus is the king. He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. And throughout the gospel of Mark up until this point, we have seen Jesus' teachings about the kingdom of God being now, that it's present, that it's come with him, and the evidence of his miracles to attest to this reality of who he is that he's the king, that he's the Messiah, that he's the son of God. I mean, remember with me, if you would, just a little bit of chapter four and five. In chapter four, Mark records for us this intentional episode in Jesus's life where he's on the boat with his disciples. They're fearing for their lives. And Jesus, with simply the command of his voice, calms the wind in the waves. This is something, especially for those that were there, only God had the ability to speak to chaos, the oceans, the waters, the winds, the waves, and have any kind of effect. Mark was evidencing for us that Jesus, he has authority over physical danger. And then chapter 5, it's just chock full of instances with Jesus that evidence once again who he is. He's able to cast out demons. He's able to heal a woman who has this 12-year issue of disease in her body. He's able to bring back to life a little 12-year-old girl just by taking her hand 
and speaking life to her. Listen, where we are in Mark 6 this morning, it's somewhat of a pivot. Everything we've been seeing so far throughout this book attests to this reality, who Jesus is. He's the King. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. And what he's teaching and how he's living, what he's doing, what he's capable of doing. But I want you to catch this with me. I need you to tune in to this thing, that there is a pivot in our chapter this morning. A pivot. Jesus at this point, in the middle of Mark chapter 6, he's at the pinnacle of popularity in his ministry. Everyone is talking about him. That's why last week when we were considering what happened to John the Baptist, the reason for that is that Mark is sharing that news made it to Herod's court about Jesus. And he's wondering, gosh, is this, is this John the Baptist raised from the dead? Everyone is speaking about Jesus. The fame, the crowds, the momentum of who Jesus is, it's peaking. And here's what we see in Mark 6 today. Mark now begins to focus on the final year of Jesus' public ministry. If you were to look at Mark 6 as a timeline, chapters 1 through 5 up into where we are in chapter 6, it's like the first two years of Jesus' public ministry. Now in Mark 6, he begins to focus on that last year before Jesus goes to the cross. And there is a shift in what Jesus does. Up until this point, he's going all over the place, preaching and performing miracles. But now, in his last year, he begins to invest himself more and more into the lives of his men, his disciples. He's starting to include them in partnership, it seems, with him. And today we're going to see that he's actually accomplishing ministry through them. Now, listen, why do I share this? Because today we're going to be reading from Mark 6, I think for many of us, a very familiar story. Feeding of the 5,000. Anyone heard of that? Once or twice, maybe? Creighton and I in the back were the only ones that went to Sunday school. Yes, you've heard this story, right? A little bit of bread, a little bit of fish and chips, right? Guy shows up to see Jesus, and, and Jesus makes a, a miracle out of it. We're going to encounter this morning a, a story, an episode, a miracle, something about Jesus that for many of us, it's not our first go around. But the text comes most alive when it's in context. When you understand all that's going on, it's like there's this dynamic of life that comes from God's word when you understand what it's saying behind the why and what around it. And I need you to catch this. What's being taught today it's very key in our understanding of what Jesus is beginning to do. Mark is evidencing for us so far who Jesus is, and Jesus has been the one performing the miracles. Jesus has been the one teaching. Now he begins to send out his disciples, verse 12 and 13 of chapter 6. Amazing things are happening. He, he recounts for us what happened to John the Baptist, but we step right back into verse 30, and look at what it says. Verse 30 of Mark chapter 6, where we begin our time in God's word this morning. It says, the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. The disciples who hear for the very first time are now identified as apostles. They come back from being sent out by Jesus to report to Jesus all that they did, all that they shared. It's the first time they're identified this way in this gospel. What is this about? What does it mean, apostle? Well, the word itself simply just means one who is sent out. Now, make no mistake, there is what is known in the Bible as an office of the apostle, and that's these guys. This is unique. This is specifically focused to them. But also this idea of being sent out. Listen to me. This is very much what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. To, to be one who, as a disciple of him, a follower of him, also is an ambassador for him. 
Paul writes it this way in 2 Corinthians 5. Let me read it to you. He says, And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us, he gave us, he's including us, this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's consumers. We are Christ's ambassadors. That's who we are. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. The first time we see here in Mark chapter 6 the disciples being identified in a different way. These are the apostles the ones whom he sent out. Is this specific to them? Absolutely. That's their office. But also, that's us. We're the ones who are sent out by Jesus. Remember Acts chapter 1? These are the words of Jesus. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. You'll be my witnesses, telling people everywhere, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. In John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus told his disciples, hey, listen, let me give you an example, boys. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Christians are sent people. We say it this way as a local church, that we live on mission. That's our mindset in life. We live on mission in our world. Everyone's world, seated in these rows and maybe joining us online, is a little different, but also a little similar to the world, to the person next to you. Yes, we share a lot of similarities and experiences, and obviously living in Gulf Breeze, who can't wait for those orange cones to one day be gone? We all are in that world, right? But we're also in a world where God's placed us, where we have a unique personality, a unique family history, a unique place of employment, unique experiences relationally or educationally. And listen to me. God has sent you to a place to live on mission with his message of condemnation. No, Paul said reconciliation. We're calling people back to God. Listen, some of the most miserable people in the world are Christians who forget that they're sent on mission. That they get saved and then they just kind of think, well, I guess it's just about amassing glory for myself or experiences or... No, 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 no. I'm saved to be in love with God, connected to his people, and then sent out to live on mission. That, that's where life is found as a human. To walk with Jesus in his mission. You ever heard of the great co-mission? He invites you into his story. And this is a lesson that I want us to catch this morning. Hopefully this isn't overwhelming, but there'll be six lessons to catch from this morning. But here's the first one. Ultimately, you and I we belong to Jesus. These men were sent out in Jesus' name, and they're reporting back to him. Here's Jesus' model of discipleship. He taught them, he sent them, had them come back to them and report and evaluate. And I love what one pastor said. He said, that's a difficult model of discipleship to improve upon. It's not just about learning, but also about living it out. And then coming back and, okay, how's it going? How can we make it better? How? Let's keep moving forward. See, these men ultimately gave an account to Jesus, and this is a lesson I want us to get. As Jesus is focused on training his disciples, here's one of the first lessons. Ultimately, we belong to Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20, Paul wrote this in a context of morality, but the truth is still the same. You do not belong to yourself, for you were bought at a high price. 
1 Corinthians 10, whatever you do, whatever you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. Colossians 3, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Listen to me now. We belong to Jesus, not our spouse, not even ourselves, not our parents, not our boss. We belong to him. Our lives are lived as a sacrifice to him. Jesus is in this moment, two years into his public ministry, at the peak of popularity. And what does he begin to do? He begins to send out his men to do ministry in his name. And they come back and they report to him. They're his sent ones. And you and I, those of us that know Jesus, be reminded this morning, ultimately, we belong to Jesus. What does that look like, belonging to Jesus? Well, let's read on. Verse 31. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that, that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. The popularity is peaking for Jesus. Crowds are everywhere. Mark describes it. It's so intense that they, they don't even have time to eat. So what does Jesus say? Get to work, boys. Work harder. No. <laughs> That's not what it's like to belong to Jesus. He says, let's get away to a quiet place and to rest. Hop in the boat and let's find a place to be alone. One thing about belonging to Jesus it's the importance, the priority of simply being with Jesus. He doesn't save us solely for our production, but our presence. And out of our presence with him comes effective production for him. See, if our first takeaway in this text of what it looks like to be one who is sent out by Jesus is to realize that, that ultimately he's the one we belong to, the second truth that I believe we must learn the, the necessary rhythm of is being with Jesus, to spend time with him. What does that look like? It looks like being in his word, being in prayer and worship and, and service to him and giving, even in fasting and just resting. But I think being with Jesus is challenging to, to pigeonhole. Say, what do you mean? It includes all those things for sure. But it's being intentionally mindful of his presence in every and all situations of our lives. Kind of like we just sang a few moments ago. The goodness of God in your life. And I want to share with you, if I can, from the words of Jesus I think what it means to be with him. Because I think to be with him and to, and to recognize that we ultimately belong to him is this constant balance of presence and production. Production and presence. You say, what do you mean by that? Jesus says it better than I. Let me read to you from John 15. Is it okay to you if I just read a lot of the Bible? Like, like 11 verses. Is that okay? Okay, it's a lot. I don't know. Verse 1 of John 15. Look at it through this lens of what does it look like to recognize that I belong to Jesus and to be with Jesus. Here it is. Jesus says, I am the true grapevine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they'll produce even more. I used to think it was safe just being in ministry so that way Jesus could just kind of, okay, don't, you don't have to mess with my life. I'm producing fruit. Oh, no, no. I want to produce more. There is this dynamic of being with Jesus where there is this concept of fruit production. But don't miss it. Listen to what he says. 
You've already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask anything you want and it will be granted. For when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. There is this dynamic of production. I have loved you. Even as the Father has loved me, remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I want you to catch this. I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Belonging to and being with Jesus. Two lessons, I believe, that Jesus in this moment in Mark 6, that is, he's prioritizing for these men, saying, don't miss this. And I love what Jesus says there in John 15, that the, the fruit of that, recognizing that in life, ultimately, I belong to him and recognizing this priority of being with him in both presence and production. You say, what do you mean? That it's the balance of both. Like he says there in John 15, that as you produce fruit, this, this brings great glory to my father. It's evidence that you're my disciple. And out of that comes joy. Wouldn't you agree that that's one of the things that the human race longs for? A sense of joy that's not attached to circumstance or situation or finance or the temperature of an outside relationship, but there's this solidity of joy? Jesus would say, it's belonging to me. It's being with me. It's your presence. It's the focus of your life being centered upon me. Well, look at what happens in verse 33 there in Mark chapter 6. It says, many people, Jesus is in the boat going to rest with his boys. Well, here's what happens. They recognize them, saw them leaving. And many people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. And Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, Jesus, this is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. Context is clear. Jesus is partnering with his disciples, his apostles. He's accomplishing ministry through them. We see this priority of belonging to Jesus, the importance of being with Jesus. But here's our third lesson. To begin to see like Jesus is so important. Remember, Jesus and the disciples, they're burnt toast, right? They're tired. Hop into the boat. Let's go across the sea. About a four-mile boat ride or so for these guys. And the crowds, the crowds, the massive crowds from any towns all around hear about this. They see Jesus and the disciples, who, as Mark kind of describes, they have their own groupies now, right? The disciples have gone out, and they're doing the same kinds of things that Jesus is doing. So they see that the disciples are there. They're hustling and jostling along the shore to meet them. They've seen the miracles, heard the teachings, 
They're hearing about Jesus everywhere. There's all these rumors about who he is. And the disciples, they have authority over demons and disease just like Jesus. These crowds are somewhat starstruck, frenzied, somewhat frantic. Maybe you can think of like the mindset of Beatlemania, right? Or believers. Remember when that was a thing? Or I guess nowadays it's all about Swifties. I don't, I don't know about these things, but like just crazy dynamics of, of fans, so to speak. That's kind of what's happening around the sea on this day as these crowds see Jesus and the disciples who are getting kind of notoriety in and of themselves because of all that they've been doing. And Mark gives us this description that as Jesus steps out of the boat, he has compassion on them. And the way he describes it is so interesting. He says, it's like he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. Now, we don't have time to unpack the nuances of that, but it's reminiscent of God's heart for his people. Maybe you remember the book of Numbers where Moses pleaded with the Lord to raise up a leader for his people, where he said, give them someone who will guide them wherever they go and lead them into battle. And so the community of the Lord will not be like a sheep without a shepherd. And Ezekiel God promised that he would one day appoint a servant who would be their God and shepherd them. And this is who Jesus is, this, this good shepherd who in compassion sees their need and begins to teach them. But it's getting late. It's the, the late afternoon, sun's going down. They're in a remote area. And the disciples say, listen, we've got to send these people away so they can get something to eat. And the language here, these aren't the disciples kind of making a, you know, Jesus, maybe it's getting kind of late. What do you No, It's like they're almost making a command. Jesus, we're tired. Send these people away. But Jesus evidence is the heart of compassion. Sees them like sheep without a shepherd who need care, leadership, provision. Pastor David Guzik says this, both Jesus and the disciples saw exactly the same need among the multitude. The disciples' solution was to get rid of the need by getting rid of the needy. Jesus saw a different solution and wanted the disciples to see it also. See, here's what I'm hoping you catch. Jesus here on the shore is using this moment as a way to instruct and encourage and teach his men. And for us, we're learning that we belong to Jesus. And it's only as we keep at the forefront that ultimately we belong to Jesus and we, we prioritize intentionally being with Jesus that we can begin to see like Jesus does. See, this scene, what we're about to read, it's designed to produce faith within his disciples. It's a lesson for us as we follow Jesus. So what does Jesus say next to this command of his disciples? Look at verse 37. He says, you feed them. Listen, have we seen Jesus interact with his disciples like this in any other case? Jesus, the boat's rocking. There's winds and waves. Boys, figure it out. No, he, he speaks to the storm. Jesus, there's a demon-possessed man in a cave. Disciples, go pray for him. No, we don't see him say that. He takes care of it. The woman with the 12-year issue, issue of blood, the man with the 12-year-old daughter who dies, Jesus steps in every single time. You've got to set yourself in the sandals of these disciples saying, Jesus, it's time to send these guys away. And then Jesus turns around and says, why don't you get them something to eat? Wait a second. <laughs> You're the superhero, Jesus. Wait, you want me to be a part of this equation? Jesus involves them and presents to them an impossible task without him. And I would say that's a phenomenal definition of what it's like to serve in ministry. Without him, I can't. And Jesus, he wants to involve us in the work he wants to do. So what's the response of the disciples? Look with me at verse 37. They say, with what, they asked. We'd have to work for months 
to earn enough money to buy food for all these people? And Jesus asked another question. How much bread do you have, he asked. Go and find out. And they came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. And then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. Given this command by Jesus to feed the crowds, they, they do this quick assessment. We know from the other three Gospels that they, they calculate that it would take nearly eight months of income to feed all those that are there. They don't have the money, especially that kind of money. Jesus asked them, what do you have? Go and find out. Survey the crowd. They've got five loaves, two fish. John 6 tells us this was like a little boy's lunchable for that day. And the disciples, they obey. It's all they're able to do. The problem's clearly beyond their resources. And then he commands them to get organized. All right, I want you to have everyone sit down in groups of 50 and 100. And now for those of us that know this story, we know what's about to happen. And as such, it's so very easy to overlook something about this that I believe Jesus is teaching his disciples that we need to embrace and embrace well. What's about to happen is miraculous. So miraculous, in fact, that out of all the four Gospels, this is the only miracle outside of the resurrection of Jesus that's spoken of in each and every single Gospel account. And all too often, we can kind of perceive the miraculous of God as mystical, fantastical, untouchable. It's all God. And listen, it truly, truly is. But look at how practically Jesus involves his disciples here. You guys take care of it. Well, they take an assessment. They, they kind of work with what they have. They organize like Jesus tells them to do. What's the point? The lessons we see in this chapter for us as disciples of Jesus are simply this. Ultimately, we belong to Jesus. We must prioritize being with Jesus so that we can begin to see like Jesus and just like the disciples here. Simply behave in obedience to Jesus. They went out, found out what they had to work with. They did things decently and in order, just like Jesus told them to. Listen, may I say this in all respect. Often I think we can say, when we, when we consider our situation, God, would you do something? Don't, don't you see my situation? Don't you see my need? And in many ways, I wonder if God is not saying, I am working. I need you to work with me. Say, so what do you mean by that? One author put it this way. God's way of provision always begins with what we already have. He wants us to use what we already have wisely. Don't foolishly pray for more from God if you don't use what he's already given you in a godly way. Now listen, these may be subpoints to the main point of what we see God doing in this text before us, but don't miss this. Jesus involves his disciples, now known as the apostles, he presents to them an impossible task without him. And what's their role? What's their responsibility? Here it is. Let me have your attention. To realize that they belong to Jesus. To prioritize being with Jesus. To, to begin to see like Jesus and then to behave in obedience to Jesus. And then what happens? What happens is something that only a miraculous God can do. Look at verse 41. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looks up toward heaven, blessed them, and then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share, and they all ate as much as they wanted. Jesus doesn't begin to kind of chant some sort of incantation. 
It's not like Ursula from The Little Mermaid, right? Like, like whipping up a spell or Merlin with a goofy hat. Jesus simply faces heaven, which is a little unique for a rabbi in those days who would often pray with, with head bowed. And he prays. He acknowledges his father, prays blessing over the bread. And here's what I find interesting in how Mark describes this. He breaks the bread in pieces and just kept giving the bread to the disciples. As he broke the loaves, the miracle occurred. Mark describes this very interestingly. The word he uses for breaking, it involves kind of like an instantaneous act. But the word forgiving, it's like continuous. See, the miracle happened in Jesus' hands. He broke the bread and then kept giving it to the disciples to give to the people. Warren Wiersbe says this, the miracle took place in his hands, not theirs. For whatever we give to him, he can bless and multiply. We are not manufacturers. We are only distributors. I love that. The stress is on Jesus, not his disciples, not his sent ones. He's the one that makes the miracle happen. He divided the fish for everyone. And as it says there, everyone ate as much as they wanted. In verse 44, it tells us there were a total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. See, in that culture, the, the men at this time would usually eat separately from women and children. So it tells us that there were 5,000 men there, and estimates range that in totality, there were anywhere between 10,000 to 25,000 people there on that shore stuffed with fish and chips that day. The disciples, they had this opportunity to be involved to be engaged, to participate firsthand in what God can only do. I hope you catch this. That at this point in Jesus' ministry, he's pouring into his disciples, his guys, his apostles. He's sending them out and they're accomplishing ministry in partnership with him and he's doing amazing things through them. And in this instant, in this episode, on that beach that day, he's sharing, teaching, kind of ministry or Christianity 101 lessons. And I hope you're tuning into these lessons. Ultimately, you and I, we belong to Jesus. That framework of understanding should shift every single dynamic in our lives. that ultimately I belong to him. Th to prioritize being with him, to begin to see like him, to behave in obedience to him, and to get to be involved firsthand in what only he can do. See, this dynamic of what happens here, that Jesus provides, I really do believe it's intended to warm our hearts to assure our souls. David Guzik makes this interesting observation. He says this, the assurance that Jesus can provide even miraculously for all of our needs should be precious to us. It was to the earliest Christians, he writes, on the walls of the catacombs, Christians living in caves, hiding from persecution. In other places of early Christian art, loaves and fishes are common pictures. This was a lesson for the disciples that ultimately God provides. That, that should warm our hearts. Should encourage our souls. Should assure us of how good our God is. You know, recently we just finished the book of Esther. The book of Esther in our daily in the word reading plan and devotionals that we put out. And I hope you're, I hope you're benefiting from those. I think the book of Esther could and should be bookmarked for believers as a source of encouragement. 
Did you know that the book of Esther is one of the only books in the Bible that the name of God is never mentioned? Never mentioned once. But it is one of the most important books of perspective on some simple truths that seem too easy to simply forget. And what is that? That there actually is a God. Would anyone say sometimes that's easy to forget? That he actually cares and that he's actively engaged in our lives. And if you read the book to the end, God wins. And some of these simple truths that seem so simple to forget are meant to be those that assure our souls and warm our hearts. Have you ever read this book? I'll put a picture of it up on the screen. You ever seen this? The Jesus Storybook Bible. I have a friend of mine who pastors a church now, and when he, he first, very first, 20, 25 years ago, began to get to know God's Word, he picked up a book like this, a children's Bible, and got this opportunity to get the main themes of what God was teaching through text that for sometimes can get complicated as you get older. I love what the author of this book writes about the Bible. She says, the Bible's not a book of rules or a book of heroes. The Bible is most of all a story. You see, the best thing about this story is that it's true, and there are a lot of stories in the Bible, but all the stories are telling the one big story, the story of how God loves his children and comes to rescue them. See, if you're not getting any of these alliterated points today, you belong to Jesus. Be with Jesus. Begin to see like Jesus. I want you to get this point. God loves you, and he's able to provide for you. One of the things that's just clear in this passage, this is a group of maybe 20 to 25,000 frenzied people it would have taken almost a year's worth of money just to throw some fish and chips at them. It's just a meal. And what does Jesus do out of compassion? He sees the people like sheep without a shepherd, spends time with them, and provides for their just simple daily need, even though it was overwhelming to anyone else. For him, just like the heart of the entire Bible, he rescues and provides. We see the miraculous provision of God, and here's the beautiful thing, through the hands of Jesus and distributed by the hands of his disciples. And how does this specific story that Mark shares, this miracle, end at the end of Mark's pen? Look at verse 43. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover Bread and fish. See, that's where you get the context. Ah. Again, if you've been reading Mark with this, maybe you remember, after all these other miracles, there's this sense of like awe, wonder, fear. Who is this man? You don't see that here. That's not the point. The point is to teach those men. To teach them what? The whole point of this miracle was not to fill the bellies of the hungry. So very true, it reminds us of the goodness and faithfulness of God. But it was there to encourage and to train and to disciple his disciples. They walk away from that encounter with a basket full of bread and fish. When God works, God works on both ends. See, what do you mean by that? When you serve... The people you serve are blessed for sure, but the ones serving, all the more so. All the more so. When God works, he works on both ends. You get blessed by serving. And here's the dynamic I want you to see. Jesus teaching his disciples as they walk away with a basket full of fish and chips, one each, they get to behold and benefit from the blessings of Jesus. And this is true of all those who belong to Jesus, who walk with him as his sent ones. Now, remember with me as we close, the goal of this book, 
It is to jolt the readers that are taking in the gospel of Mark into a clear understanding of who Jesus is, that he's the king, he's the Messiah, he's the son of God. He's preaching that the kingdom of God has come now. And here in Mark 6, as we're at the, the peak and the pinnacle of the popularity of Jesus, the fame and the crowds and the momentum are just, just peaking. He's now pouring into his disciples, his apostles, his men. And this account teaches us for sure that God loves, that he rescues, that he provides. That's, that's the story of the story. And I hope you know that today, that you're reminded that God loves you and cares for you and he can provide. I pray that the word of God and that the fellowship with the people of God are a source of proper perspective for that. But it's interesting, with this miracle, the feeding of the, the 5,000, better yet, the feeding of the 15 or 25,000, it doesn't end like all these other ones that we've been reading about. But the disciples walking away with a basket full. This miracle wasn't so much about filling hungry bellies or validating his message, though it does. But Jesus is accomplishing ministry with and through his disciples. Listen, we're almost done. That, that's what he wants to do in your life today, to accomplish ministry. This, this beautiful balance of presence with him and production for him, like John 15 talks about. That's where joy is. That's where, where joy that overflows is. It's not anywhere else. What, what does that look like? It, it looks like this. Ultimately recognize you do not answer ultimately. You do not ultimately belong to anyone else other than Jesus. You've heard this phrase a billion times, but you, you live for the audience of one. That's where freedom is. That's where joy is found. Jesus here in this text is having his disciples come back to him. And report to him. And listen, he's the one you'll give an account to in your life. Live for him. That, that's where joy is. Ultimately, you belong to Jesus. Prioritize being with Jesus. And as you recognize that ultimately you belong to him, as you spend time just simply being with him, you'll begin to see like Jesus. Sometimes we need bumpers on the bowling alley to see like Jesus, if that makes any sense. It's very easy to move away from the perspective that Jesus wants for us. But just like these disciples, they're learning these Christianity 101 lessons. They behave in obedience to Jesus. You know, we walk by sight and reason and clarity. That's the way we should walk as Christians, right? We walk by faith. We walk by trust in him. What were they thinking when Jesus said, hey, why don't you guys feed him? What? This is on us. Well, let's go figure out what we got. We got a Lunchable, Jesus. Okay, get him organized. Get him organized for the Lunchable? There's no clarity. There's no reason. There's no assessment. What are we doing? Walking by faith. You don't graduate from that. And in the reality, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, you walk by faith in every, evidence, in every atmosphere of your life. It's just dependent upon who you're placing that faith in. And these guys, they, they, they begin to behave in obedience to Jesus, just trusting him. Okay, that's what he's told me to do. And here's what happens. They get to be involved firsthand in what Jesus is doing. And they get to benefit and behold, literally behold the basket, the blessings that Jesus offers. Life is not about making more money. Life is not creating a better childhood for your kids than you had. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the bottom line. That's not where joy, like John 15, that Jesus is speaking about, that's not the spout that it comes out from. The spout of joy comes from the presence of the Lord and walking with him. 
and allowing him, as you just abide in him, as he's the vine and you're the branches, allowing fruit to be produced. I hope you're catching this, that Jesus here with his disciples, as he sees those disciples walk away with a basket full of, of food, it's a teaching moment for them. Okay, ultimately, I belong to Jesus. I need to be with Jesus. I need to begin to see like Jesus. I need to behave in obedience to Jesus and trust and know and believe that I get to be involved in what Jesus does and I get to benefit. I get to be right there. I get blessed on both ends by serving him. As we close this morning, I hope you're encouraged by this wonderful example of God's provision. But also, I hope you're encouraged and trained and discipled, so to speak, of what it looks like to walk with Jesus as a sent one. Because as a Christian, just like Paul wrote, that's who we are. We're his ambassadors. As Jesus said, Acts chapter 1, we're his witnesses. So this week, may we be reminded to realize that we belong to Jesus, to prioritize being with Jesus, begin to behave like Jesus, and recognize that God is good. And let's trust him with whatever he's placed in our hands to lend themselves always for his glory and for the good of others.